Hello, my name is Nick Huntington Klein. We are going to finally, finally in this video be talking about causal diagrams, what they are, maybe a little bit of what we can do with them and what they represent. So uh, we are going to be trying to write down our data generating process in a simple diagram. We want to know where our data came from so that we can use that knowledge about where the data came from to try to identify a particular causal effect of interest. Uh, and to do that, we can write down a causal diagram. So uh, what is a causal diagram? So a causal diagram is sort of a, it's a graph, right? You have a bunch of variables on there that represent different variables that might be in your data or maybe even in your data, perhaps. Uh, and you have arrows between those different uh, variables representing how one variable causes another. We talked about what that means in the previous video. Uh, and that is it. That is literally all that a causal diagram is. Uh, it is a list of variables that is relevant to the thing that you are trying to study. And then it is a set of arrows linking those variables from one to another to represent that this variable causes that one. That is it. Uh, now that's a pretty straight straightforward answer. There is, of course, a lot of complexity hidden in that in terms of what does a variable mean? Uh, what can we do with all these diagrams? What are some of the finer points of analyzing them? Uh, how can we actually study them? Uh, how do we make sure we have the right one? There's a lot of stuff going on there, but for now, we're just gonna talk about what it is. So let's start by talking about variables. What are variables in a statistical setting? So a variable is a measurement uh, that can be taken across many different observations, and we have different values of that measurement. That's what a variable it is, something that varies over different observations. Uh, so for example, if you have a thousand people and you took what color of hair they had, somebody might have brown hair, somebody else might have blonde hair, uh, somebody else might have red hair, somebody else might have black hair, and you would keep writing down all these different hair colors that you had, and that would be a variable. Hair color would be a variable, and it might take the values of blonde or red or black or whatever. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing we talk about with the types of variables that use, different types of variables that each have different values. Now, a key distinction here is that the variable here is hair color. It's not brown hair or red hair or blue, blonde hair, it is hair color. And then in that variable hair color, there are many different values that it could take. So that's what a variable is. And we're gonna want to have a list of all the variables that are relevant to whatever our research question. So if I was interested in the question of, well, does, ha does ha hair color affect you know, your performance in the labor market? Maybe there's some sort of bias towards people with certain kinds of hair colors. Uh, well, then we would want to think about all the variables that are relevant in that scenario. Maybe hair color is relevant. Certainly, we want to know some measurement of your uh, job performance, uh, maybe, or, or your, your job pay, maybe how much salary you earn or other sorts of benefits that you have. Those are all variables that we might measure. Uh, we would measure for you how much money do you earn at your job. One person earns 30000 one person earns 40000 one person earns 100000 and so on and so forth. These are the different values that those variables can have. Once we have our set of variables, we can think about how one variable causes the other uh, and which variables cause each other. And this all comes from theory. We'll talk a bit more in future videos about how we can narrow this down a little bit, but let's just say that we happen to have a pretty good idea of which variables cause which other variables. So let's say that we are interested in the idea that maybe hair color affects your earnings in the labor market. So we would say that hair color causes your earnings. At least that's the thing that we are trying to study. Uh, there might be other variables on our diagram, of course. Uh, so maybe we have something like your intelligence. Uh, it would probably also be related to your earnings in the labor market. Uh, and maybe it's related to your hair color. We'd have to think about that theoretically, whether we think that is the case or not. Once we have our set of variables that we think are relevant, uh, maybe that includes intelligence, maybe that includes your sort of get up and go, maybe it includes your network connections, your, your parents' social standing, and all sorts of things we would write down and think about the arrows that go between them. We would draw a diagram. Let's do a quick example of a very simple diagram. So let's say uh, that you have uh, some cake and you're eating this cake in your office kitchen in a non-pandemic environment. Uh, and Brad comes in and Brad says, hey, I would like some of your cake. I'll flip a coin for you for that cake. Well, now what we are interested in, we're, we're thinking about what's going to be the data generating process here. We'll do, we have some data that we could see. Uh, we're going to flip a coin. That coin could turn out to be heads or tails. So one variable that we would have would be the outcome of the coin flip and the values that that could take would be heads and tails. Uh, we would also observe uh, who has the cake. Do you have the cake or does Brad have the cake? So one variable that we would have is, do you have cake? Uh, and the answers to that might be yes or no. If we wanted to be a bit more general, maybe we'd say who has the cake and we'd say Brad or you. Uh, so now we have two variables. Uh, we have coin flip and we have the cake and we have uh, a, a relationship. If the coin flip determines who gets the cake, then we would say that the coin flip causes the cake outcome. Right, so we would draw an arrow from coin flip to cake. 
And there we have it, we have our very first, very simple causal diagram. Now, of course, things can get a lot more complex than this in the real world they tend to, so let's, uh, let's expand things a little bit with this diagram. Let's say that not only does the coin flip determine the cake, it also determines who gets to keep the coin. Maybe the, the winner gets the cake, but the loser gets the coin. So not only will the coin flip determine whether you get cake, it will also determine how much money you have. Uh, and so now the coin flip is causing two different things, which is totally fine. One variable can cause two different things. In this case, coin flip is causing both cake and how much money you have. Uh, and let's go even further. Let's say that you have a friend, Terry, uh, and if Terry happens to be in the room, then they will observe the outcome of the coin flip. And if, if you lose your coin, Terry will feel bad for you and will give you a coin to make up for it. So Terry's presence in the room, whether they happen to be there at that point, will also affect your money. So now money has two different causes, which again is totally fine. One variable can cause two different things as coin flip causes both cake and money. And one variable can be caused by two different things, just like how money is caused by both coin flip and Terry being in the room. So you can already see how a basic causal diagram might come together. You think about the setting that you have, you think about the different variables that you are interested in, and what it is that determines what makes those variables happen in one way or another, what determines the distribution of those variables. Anything that changes the distribution of a variable should be a cause of that variable. The coin flip affects the distribution of how much money you have, and therefore coin flip should cause money. One last thing to point out with this simplified diagram is that we should be including variables whether or not we can actually measure them, right? We are interested in what are the underlying laws that of the universe that cause the data to be the way that it is. That is not contingent on whether or not you can actually measure these things. It's just what actually caused these things to happen. So for example, we talked about Terry being in the room, whether Terry happens to be around to reimburse you for the money that you lost. Uh, maybe that depends on how Terry is feeling that day. Now we can't measure Terry's mood, uh, but we can sort of say, well, yeah, Terry's mood is important here. So we might put a variable called Terry's mood on this diagram, which causes Terry to be in the room or not, uh, And but we can't observe it. Uh, and we would still put it on the diagram even though we can't observe it, because that's going to turn out to be very important when we are thinking about causal identification when we're trying to figure, isolate just a, an explanation that we're interested in with causal identification, uh, and those alternate explanations are gonna pop up whether or not they're things that we can measure or not. There's still gonna be problems even if we can't measure them. So we gotta think about those things ahead of time. Uh, now sometimes, uh, and in this case, you'll see that the, uh, the Terry's mood variable, because we can't measure it, I sort of grade it out a little bit just to indicate to the reader that it cannot be measured. Sometimes these unmeasured variables uh, are a little bit hard to put our finger on. We know that maybe there's some unmeasured characteristic going on, but we don't know exactly what it is. We might just put some sort of like placeholder variable there. So for example, here I've included the variable U1 uh, to indicate that there's some unknown factor that both causes people to wear shorts and eat ice cream. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, whatever it could be, but there's something there uh, that tends to cause both of these things. And this would cause shorts and ice cream to be related to each other, even though I haven't drawn a direct relationship between the two, because whatever U1 is, maybe it's temperature, I don't know. Whenever that happens to be uh, high or low, that's gonna induce a relationship between those two variables. So of course, this is a very simplified example that doesn't really make sense, like who uh, you know flips a coin for some cake and that also tarries in the room and they reimburse you, that's kind of weird. But the same idea applies when you're working on much more complex problems. So for example, here is another diagram that, look, that tries to look at the question of what is the effect of police presence on crime? Does, does having more police on the streets reduce crime or not? And that's an interesting question that we might want to be in, to think about. And we would want to draw out a causal diagram that represents where we think the data on crime and police come from. Uh, so here's an example, and I will say this is a simplified example. You can probably think of some things that might be important, uh, like poverty, for example, that's not on this diagram. Uh, and yeah, it gives us an idea of how we might think different pieces of the puzzle fit together. Uh, so we have the number of police per capita that happen to be around. We might think that that causes crime directly. So we have an arrow from police per capita to crime. Uh, we might also think that one reason why police might have an effect on crime is that uh, it may it changes the payout of crime. If there's a lot of police around, you might be less likely to think that you can get away with a crime. So you might be less likely to commit it. And so one reason why police per capita might cause crime is because it affects the expected crime payout. So we see an arrow here from police per capita to the expected crime payout, which it is itself affects crime, sort of a deterrent effect kind of thing. Uh, and that is one way you can, we can start to see how these diagrams are valuable, because not only can we see a relationship between two variables, but we can see pathways starting to emerge. And this is something we'll talk about a lot more as we go on. 
Uh, why does might police per capita affect crime? Well, one thing is directly, maybe they police directly stop a crime in progress. That's the arrow from police per capita to crime. But also maybe they just make criminals realize that they're less likely to get away with it and then choose to commit less crime on their own. And that is represented by the police per capita to expected crime payout to crime set of arrows. We have a pathway that we can walk. And this explains why we might see two variables being related to each other. And this will help us narrow down our research question of interest. Seeing a diagram like this helps us to also think about what part of the diagram is the part that we are interested in. Uh, so for example, if I want to know if police affect crime, I would want to know a couple of these different pathways represent the things that I'm interested in. So I might want to know, do police directly stop crime? I'm interested in the arrow from police per capita to crime. I might also say, yeah, you know, police stop crime by deterring criminals because they criminals don't think they can get away with it anymore. Then yeah, that counts too. So I would want the police per capita to expected crime payout to crime pathway as well. All the other pathways I don't want, right? If police per capita are, is related to crime because of lag crime. So if, if, if it, a, an area happens to be particularly high crime, they might get more police assigned to them as a result. And then that might be related to current crime. Uh, even if it wasn't necessarily the police's, the police causing that crime or reducing that crime, it's just that they happened to be assigned to areas that were already high or low crime. I don't want that to count. And so you can see on the diagram that there's another pathway that I don't want to count. So police per capita to lagged crime to crime is a pathway on this diagram. Uh, and so when I'm thinking about answering my research question, I need to think what are the pathways on this diagram that I want to count? What are the pathways that I don't want to count? And how can I get rid of the ones that I don't want to count, letting me identify the answer to my research question? And that's the real that where the real value of these causal diagrams is going to end up being, is in the ability to look at a diagram, partial out what are the parts we want to look at, what are the parts that we don't, and then being able to figure out how to pull out just the parts that we want and getting rid of the parts that we don't. All right, uh, that is it for this video. Uh, as we go on, we're going to talk about how we can draw these causal diagrams on our very own. Thank you.